like an elephant stepping on a tube of toothpaste. It's just going to rock it up vertically. And I go to bed some nights thinking is tonight the night I wake up and Bitcoin's got a floor set at a million dollars. Yeah, you're right. I don't really believe that, but it's because I think that's too bearish, right? Yes, that's, <laughs> like, that's I think the funny it's too thing. pessimistic, right? So it's like... So. I, I had a conversation uh -huh. recently where someone said, you think Bitcoin's going to be $7 billion a coin? I went, yeah, that's a conservative figure. Straight face and I... I okay, I get the large... But come on, Peter. How can I take you seriously? Seven? Yeah. Not million. Billion. Billion. Okay. You know, a lot of people give me criticism on that to say, oh, you know, there's not enough money in the world for that number. And I'm like, all right, here we are. We are in LA. My friend Peter and I. Peter, thank you for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you in real life. Yep. Yep. This is a blast. We've been looking forward for over half a year now to meet up in person. And so now here we are and enjoying beautiful weather here in LA, Santa Monica. So it's a gorgeous place. I've got to say, I was surprised just how beautiful this place is like it is absolutely stunning i understand why people want to be here so yeah it's a yeah, great great spot great company looking forward to having yeah, chat to definitely you. but after all this time it's so surreal because we talk a lot on the phone podcast we do that and then to actually be here in real life it's um it's a treat so i'm looking forward to it yeah yeah that's great so um so i guess let's get into it we've come across the world to make this happen so yep. um what since we've talked last, what are your views on the world and Bitcoin? What's going on? I especially want to hear your views on the Fed versus ECB because I think you've got some very interesting theories there. But um, what do you think? What do you think is going on with these battle of the central banks? I, I think we're, you know, we're shooting this now. It's the fourth of October, is it? Fourth yeah. of October, yeah. and it looks like things in the bond markets are very close to breaking. You've got um, inflation is still out of control to some some respect and you've now got um, a precipitous drop in in bonds like bond yields are just going through the roof um, in an attempt to try and rectify the situation and I think the, the bond market smelling there's a major problem the equity markets though uh, seem to be oblivious to this and this is where you know I, I'm sitting here looking at this thinking something clearly isn't right um, I, I don't know what's wrong but you know everyone can sort of feel it it's inflation it's you know this insipid tax that just keeps grinding prices higher and the bond market sniffing that out too and trying to adjust its yield to yeah. kind of account for that and this is where i think at this point in time um it feels uh, quite ominous particularly being in october typically you know major financial crashes happen between september and you know first two weeks of november so we're right in the middle of it and i think a lot of people know that and feel like you know we're on the the brink of something major happening and um ironically bitcoin though just keeps ticking along doing its thing totally oblivious yeah. to all of these market considerations yeah it's completely irrelevant one of the things i i used to talk about with people about bitcoin is about how thinking through the rest of the fiat currencies, through the dollar, you see not the dollar going up, but all the other ones going down faster. Yeah. And then with Bitcoin, of course, it's the same thing except just one currency up, let's say. And so one thing, and I don't know how much you want to say on camera, but I've really enjoyed your thoughts about thinking, you know, because I've asked you, like, when do you think the Fed pivots? When do you think these things turn? And obviously in the long term, it doesn't matter. But to me, in this transition period, it's really interesting to think about how these different political currencies, these different fiat currencies are like in competition with each other of like for liquidity figuring out which can 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 have um can tighten each other's liquidity faster so i don't know if you have any thoughts on that on what the on what the rest of the world looks like not just the u.s because obviously what you and, and uh, peter on uh, what mcqueen did that was an interesting discussion with the uk and the australia yeah. perspective so i don't know if you have any thoughts as an international well, i, I do that. and i think you know maybe um a lot of the commentary i see from you know around the macro talks about how um imminent the demise of the US dollar is and I'm like that may be a little myopic a little narrow-minded in the fact that <laughs> if you're able to look around the world and realize just how bad everything else is all of a sudden this looks really good and I've got to say like it looks really good and to put an international flavor to this you know typically Australian rates uh, well Australia full stop is a much higher risk than the US dollar yet our reserve rates in Australia are at 4.1% America's at 5.1 or 5 over. Um, you know, how does that work? Australia is a, you know, 2% of the global economy.
economy. You guys are a 15 times larger economy, the global reserve currency. You know, all we do is basically dig stuff out of the ground, send it overseas to China for processing and then sending us back. This, this doesn't compute in my mind that, you know, you've got typically Australia's interest rates sat between the US and New Zealand. Now the US is at five, New Zealand's at five and a half, Australia should be somewhere in between. We are not a stronger currency or stronger economy than the US, yet we're acting like it. So what that means is, yes, we've got inflation under control a little better, but I think the US is in a much better spot economic-wise than Australia is, yet we have yeah. lower interest rates. Now, that could be for a number of reasons, because I think our economy is far more dependent on housing, so you know you can't jack rates up fast enough and yeah. you know blow the whole place up. Um, but it, it's funny, you know, in Australia you get 4% on your money, in Australia you get risk-free, and it's the global risk-free, it's not the local risk-free, of 5% um, or 5% plus, and, you know, I've just seen 30-year treasuries approaching 5%. Like, this is unbelievable. Like, if you're a, you know, to get 5% on your money, if we were having this conversation 18 months ago, there's no way on earth that would happen. So, I mean, it's just a, a, an enormous shift from where we were to where we are now, and you know, everyone's, you know, thinking pivot, 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 but what if that's not their end goal? What's, what if that's not what they actually want to achieve? And this is, you know, probably a deeper conversation on, you know, maybe that's not what the Fed's trying to do here. You know, and if you think about it, um, in broader terms, the ECB is trying to introduce central bank digital currencies, and there's factions of the Federal Reserve that are trying that too, but the central bank digital currency, if controlled by the ECB, is an existential threat to the Federal Reserve. So all of a sudden, well, maybe the Federal Reserve and the ECB aren't as friendly as we think they are. Yeah. So. I mean, to me, it makes sense because you have the dollar, then you have the euro, then you have the, the yen and the yuan. I mean, it's like, these are essentially competing in a zero-sum game, basically. Yeah. You know, as Jeff Booth would say, there are different systems of, th of theft, and each one's stealing from each other and their own citizens at different rates. And so, I mean, it, on one hand, they're kind of working together, but on the other hand, it's just... <laughs> A competition to a certain degree, as far as I can tell. So correct, and it's a meta game, and the U.S. is by far the dominant player at it. And yeah. for everyone thinking, oh, you know, we're going to have BRICS totally come in and disrupt U.S. dollar hegemony, I just don't <laughs> see it. I'm like, I get it. I know all of these places, you know, these things are in place, and I could like, I, you know, we could be looking back in ten years' time, and you know, it's a Paul Krugman fax machine type yeah. comment, which. I've got no doubt it will change, but I just don't think it's going to change anywhere nearly as quickly as people think. Yeah. The US dollar is still, you know, God in in dollar terms globally. Yeah. There's no competition to it because there's no liquidity. And if you actually look at the flows and the, you know, the, the trade, it's all US dollar. Despite the odd headline contract of, you know, the Saudis yeah. accepting Chinese yuan and Russia accepting Indian rupees, like, just think that through for a minute. Yeah. like. Russia's accepting Indian rupees, and it's like, I've got these rupees. <laughs> what am I going to? What's Russia going to do with it? Like, no one wants rupees. Like I hate to say it, but, yeah. and I don't mean to offend anyone. And to be fair, India is a rising power, and I think they've got a huge economic um, boom in front of them. But is it going to compare to the U.S. dollar? Like, it is a long, long way from competing with U.S. dollar because. You know, people talk about a you know de-dollarizing the world. Well, because all of the US, well, because all of the debt, the majority of the debt in the world is U.S. denominated. Guess what? We've got to re-dollarize before we de-dollarize. Yeah. So all of a sudden, all that debt needs to be reappropriated and back into the you know paid out in U.S. dollars. So what does that do? It creates demand for U.S. dollars. So all of a sudden, I'm like, I, I understand the points intellectually around the adoption of other currencies and I think it's probably a good thing you know to help extract the US from the Triffin dilemma but the reality and the practicality of it no one really wants that because you know to the point here you know we're in the US if I turned up with Aussie dollars they may as well be Vol Venezuelan bolivars here yeah everyone would look at me and go this paper money like well firstly it's plastic <laughs> and it's you know not worth the paper it's written on now the US dollars worth something because we're here and if I tried to give someone 20 Aussie dollars for a you know, $20 US or a $10 US, they'd look at me and throw it away and say, beat it. I don't want your crummy money. And yeah. the, the big game I see playing out is what happens when the world realises that 
Bitcoin is to the US dollar what the US, what the Aussie dollar is to the US dollar. I think everything you said into that last sentence, the vast majority of people would agree with. I think the vast majority of people would agree that the dollar is the best. There's no second best political currency. America, you know, FBI rule the world. All that. But then you bring in Bitcoin, and then I think you just lose. So You've many lost people. me. <laughs> You've yeah. lost me, right? <laughs> yep. So why now getting into Bitcoin? Why is Bitcoin? The exception to that why is it the one currency that unlike all the other currencies is actually competing against the dollar it can't be fudged in a sentence this is the hardest form of money we've ever seen it's a total system of money too which is very unique and no other money has that um, if you look at the functions of money it's store of value mean of exchange unit of account sadly the US dollar has lost the store of value component of those three functions of money. Uh, it still has the unit of account and the meat of exchange. It's 80% plus of global trade. So it's not unassailable, but it's uh, it's a dominant market player that's irrefutable as, as the leader in that, that respect. But money has three functions, not one function. And although it's like absolutely dominant to the tune of over 80% in meat of exchange, unit of account gets done in every currency globally depending on what locale you're in and then the critical I think um, reason why Bitcoin in time will become the dominant is because of the store of value function in that you can't be diluted once you have a percentage of the network then that's what you have and and you can never be diluted that is a very powerful thing that enables you to harness and store your purchasing power through time which is something we haven't really had the ability to do up until now so sadly not many people understand that um, people don't really comprehend the magnitude of something that is the best function of money um, in all three use cases all of a sudden that that is something that's totally unique yeah. and um, the comprehension comprehension of that takes a long time to really sink in and think through the implications of that and sadly it took me five years and I thought I was you know well versed in and you know um, train have a living in working in and around finance but it still took me an enormous amount of time to really comprehend the magnitude of what this is so it's going to be great we're, we're just so early to that and this is where I think what's really valuable is having these conversations to hope hopefully get that message to more people that there is so much more here than we you know than yeah. we can even possibly understand at this point in time so so you've been in the family office space for over 20 years and it took you five years to figure out this Bitcoin idea of being mean of exchange plus unit of account plus store value together maybe maybe even longer okay. yeah like and and this is what i find so frustrating because i'm like you know i'm i'm trained in this i studied this i talked about business as a child with you know the family um went to university studied accounting and finance like i should know this i've you know i feel silly admitting this but like it took me five years to learn this and i'm thinking well i do this day in day out for a job i'm in and around finance and ironically i think all of that classical training in traditional finance markets is actually uh, an impediment to learning about Bitcoin than actually thinking about it from a first principles because you need to disregard everything that you've learned up until that point because this is the paradigm shift with Bitcoin it is a complete game changer and sadly there are no um, benchmarks or posts or lighthouses to reference when you move into the Bitcoin world it is a completely foreign beast to anything we've ever seen in finance so um, yeah it took it took a good five years yeah. to <laughs> comprehend it and hundreds if not thousands of hours of talking to my brother who was very patient very kind in <laughs> sort of getting me up that education yeah. curve to understand it so um, and you're still the first one percent of people to learn about it figure it out it took you all these years and likewise for me it took me a bunch of years and yet we're still super early and there's so many more people that are yet to begin their five year or ten year or three year journeys of trying to figure this out so it's it's fascinating and I, I fully agree with your point about having to unlearn stuff just yesterday on, on, on uh, Twitter or X or whatever um, someone was tweeting about how they they have an, an MBA in finance and they have all this experience or whatever and they're like I didn't understand I didn't understand money until I learned about Bitcoin and you know I was like hey you want to come to my show and he said I can't because 
you know, my job and everything else. And I've gotten that so many times. And that's what's awesome about you is that you're one of the few uh, financial advisors, family office people that are able to have the freedom to say this and say this with the conviction you do. Because most people, in my experience, they can't because they're tied up at the current job or they're tied up with their current worldview. And that's like unacceptable as a worldview to, to share or to talk about publicly. So, And I understand why that's the case. but Yeah, there's, you know. there's a lot of licensing that goes into financial advice. Yeah. And so one of those limitations is, is that when you deal with most financial advisors, you're not dealing with them and their thoughts on the market. Yeah. You're dealing with a, a preconditioned uh, approved product list that yeah. they're allowed to talk about. And if Bitcoin's not on that product list, guess what? They can't talk about it, which is, it's very frustrating because I look at this and think Bitcoin is the ultimate hedge. It's an asset that exists outside the system that will effectively envelop the system. And the asymmetrical bet to the upside, that's the opportunity, which is Bitcoin, is, is an avenue to ensure yourself and extract yourself from all of the misery that I think is about to come to the existing system so it's the ultimate hedge and it doesn't require a lot of investment in relative terms and when we first started talking about bitcoin to clients you know we talked of having an allocation of one to two percent just put one to two percent in and this is where you know getting off zero one of your messages which is so critical um, the clients we deal with one to two percent is inconsequential and you know in That's relative a volatility to Correct. In the stock market, yeah. And that's literally what I used to tell them. Like, hey, 1% to 2%, it, if I'm completely wrong, we've lost 1% to 2%, which is a bad day. And you know what? Bad days coming up with the volatility we've got are probably going to look like, you know, 4 or 5%. So maybe we need to up that allocation of 4 to 5%. Yeah. Um, and one thing that happens, though, with that 1% to 2% is the more clients understand about this, the higher that allocation goes. And so the more you know, the more you buy, the more you invest. And yeah. this is where you know, I'm very grateful for the work you do in helping educate people about that because it hopefully educates them up that um, education piece around Bitcoin to feel confident to invest more money in it. Yeah. And this is a, a critical piece. Yeah. I think it's one of the things people miss about me, a hyperbole, and you, a hyperbole, is that I think people often think that we're claiming this is the end of the dollar, we're gonna have hyperinflation in you know, three years or whatever, you know, like these kinds of bold claims. I, I think people come to those conclusions when in reality, both you and me, my message is not go all in right now. My message is get off zero with the understanding that there's a non-zero probability that this Bitcoin orange future occurs where it absorbs everything, you know? And so in light of that, where number one, there's that huge opportunity ahead, and number two, there's this big threat to the existing system simultaneously, then that's where getting off zero with the one, two, five, whatever percent allocation makes perfect sense to me because it's both this asymmetric bet to the upside and this hedge simultaneously in one thing, in one storing of value. So. And, and, and this is where um, some of the conversations we have with clients don't really look at the full investing yeah. picture when thinking about Bitcoin. They see Bitcoin and say, no, not interested, don't want to talk about it. And it's like, well, Let's go through the gamut of investment options that we've got out there and have a look at what what that future looks like because investing really needs to take place. It's never in isolation. You're not making investments in isolation. It's all relative. It's all an opportunity cost of what you could be investing in. And this is where when you basically view the field of what are the available investments, you know, you've got bond markets about to implode exceptionally dangerous at the moment I think to look at um, or invest in the 60-40 portfolio that's nowhere these days um, I think there is a time and a place for bonds now might not be the right place or well, right time well the, well the 25 year now has greater losses than Bitcoin and the 2008 equity crash here in the US I don't know if you knew that or not but no, I isn't that it. crazy <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild and this is where those bond markets are so huge like just in the last say 12 months from January to January, there was nearly a 30% loss in long-term bonds. And I look at this and I think, you know, long-term bonds must be, oh, I would have thought somewhere between 50 to $100 trillion. And you look at that capital destruction in that one year period of time, you've chewed up somewhere between 15 to $30 trillion of value, never to come back. Yes, you might get a bit of it, but... Or we print the difference. That's exactly what's gonna happen. 
yep. and this is the problem. You've got the Federal Reserve stepping in to basically make the bank solvent, and I look at this and I, there, there is a complete mismatch between <clears throat> the certain treatment of different assets. And I'll just finish the point on the, get, the, the field of investment opportunities. Bonds are really hard outside of maybe short-term bonds. It looks you know, quite tough. Property, I don't like the look of commercial real estate. It looks like there's some hefty valuations and a lot of air between what it's priced at and what it really is valued at. Um, you look at you know, residential housing, I think with rates going through the roof, that market's now absolutely locked and you know, needs rates to drop to create some fluidity in that market and get price discovery. And then you look at the stock market. You've got the bond market going, you know, capitulating, or it feels like that right now, and the stock market's oblivious, which tells me, like, who's right in this picture? It's, um, it's a fascinating take. And you look at those things relative to Bitcoin, it's like a 2% allocation. Like, if people understood the risks in our existing system and really applied rigor to that, um, a 2% allocation might need to be a little higher. Yeah. Definitely. And most people are nowhere close to a 2%. They're still in zero. So, yep. Yeah. So, okay, let's say we're right. Let's say we think this through. Let's say people get the 2%, and then and since everyone has the 2%, then people want the 4%, then they want the 6%, then the 12%, you know, people just get more and more higher allocations, you know, and eventually we have a Bitcoin world. Obviously, we, we already mentioned it earlier, but your triple point asset idea, medium of exchange, unit of account, and store value simultaneously in the first asset. Could you break that down, your hyperbull sure. case for, for Bitcoin here? So, this is the unique thing about Bitcoin. It's the first asset in history that has all three functions of money at the same time. But not only is it all three functions of money at the same time, it is clearly the best at each of those functions of money at the same time. So individually. Individually. So in in up until Bitcoin you had store of value was dominated by gold historically, and that's a ten trillion dollar market cap. And for the last 5,000 years, people have denominated their value or store of value in gold. Um, <clears throat> medium exchange is a different beast. That's what you want on a daily trade, global trade, whatever that might be. Um, that's a $100 trillion market cap, and that's dominated by the US dollar. Um, ironically, I don't see that changing anytime soon, and the whole medium exchange when it comes to Bitcoin, I think is a bit of a moot point, but I can cover that off if you want later and the final function of money is this, the unit of account now this is our ledger system you know we've basically got uh, an immutable ledger supply and issuance which has never been able to be created before and so what this means for me is this is a much better unit of account than we've ever seen before but we really can't comprehend what that means because it feels like we are monkeys trying to operate a nuclear power plant we don't even know what the functionality of this is yet, but I know it's going to redefine society and it's going to, I believe, dramatic, dramatically change the incentive structure of broader society. And so if you look at those three functions of money, Bitcoin now dominates all three of those. And now Bitcoin dominates and supersedes you know, the store of value function of gold because it's um, absolute scarcity of 21 million. It's seizure resistant. Um, you look at medium exchange, the US dollar is dominant. I don't expect that to be dislodged anytime soon, but that medium exchange function, Bitcoin improves, I believe, because it's digital. Um, there's an, an immutable supply and issuance. And the final thing is that it's censorship resistant, which I think is a massive upgrade if you're, you know, that if you value property rights. And then the unit of account comes with an immutable ledger supply and issuance, which is completely different to what we see in our existing system. You know, in our existing system, we just print money out of thin air and it goes on the ledger and it's a journal entry. Yeah. If they want to add four trillion dollars, you just need to hold your finger on that zero button, if, you know, for a fraction of a second longer, and it puts another zero on every split second. Yeah. So, all of a sudden, you know, you you're left with a massive improvement in that. And the key thing I think about is, from an economic perspective, we have never had one asset that. Um, converges those three functions of money and now a lot of people are looking at this I think incorrectly that they think oh well the market cap for Bitcoin is store of value plus medium exchange plus unit of account and it's like I I understand why you think that but that's um, not not thinking about it correctly I believe because you now have for the first time in history 
store of value, having to compete with medium exchange, having to compete with unit of account. So we're at this very unique situation where all the functions of money now have to compete for space on the blockchain. And then this is where I think it goes exponential very quickly because the, the formula for that should be something more like store of value multiplied by medium exchange multiplied by unit of account. And this is where, you know, a lot of people give me criticism on that to say, oh, you know, there's not enough money in the world for that number. And I'm like, money is a construct. And yes, there is enough money in the world, but it's going to be redefined and housed in different ways. So because um, very quick sort of economics lesson, price is determined at the margin and market cap is downstream of price. So the market cap, everyone looks at the market cap and goes, oh, there's not that much money in the world. And it's like, yes, I've done the numbers. I'm not stupid. I understand that. But the market cap is going to be whatever the market cap is going to be because the price is determined at the margin. So the price will, the market cap will be what it is, but the price is the price. Could you give an example of that for people that may not be following what you're saying there with price or market cap being the downstream of price? Sure. So um, if we look at... Um, I'm trying to think of an example that would be which, which, very simple. Which, to clarify, like I have the similar thing. You know, I talk about Bitcoin. You know, you talk about billions. I, I throw out lots of absurd quote unquote numbers too, and people say the same thing. Like, oh, Luke, you're so dumb. You can't do basic math. There's not enough money in the world. And it's like, I try to explain from that first principles. Uh, you know, like, like for example, right now we're recording this conversation on a bunch of iPhones. Yeah. You know, you know, a bunch of smartphones. And it's like, if we were to look back a few decades ago, you know, what's your calculator worth? Then what's your camera worth? And what's this worth? And that's what worth. And it's like if you take all these innovations and you put them in one device, you know, what, what's the price of that? I mean, you know, like you, these smartphones are worth multitudes more than all those former inferior technologies were worth added or multiplied together. And the cost is getting cheaper and cheaper. And I think, I, I think we don't see that because as Jeff Booth says, you know, everything falls to the marginal cost of production, you know, towards zero. And so these things just become part of life and we don't have a price to that because prices keep falling down, falling down in um, nominal terms, but the prosperity is increasing hyper exponentially and so then obviously with Bitcoin it's different in that it actually does reflect that nominal absorption of that value so so anyway I fully understand what you're saying you get the same thing all the time where people don't understand that what you're saying of, of market cap being downstream of price but um, anyway yeah I don't know if you have an example of that just well to help people get a better idea of what that means but I, I think probably a like a ten, like a visceral example of this would be um, using Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk you know, two very wealthy men who have made themselves from nothing into, you know, the richest men on earth. And you look at how their wealth is made, it's derived in, by creating value in a company. And you look at this and think, okay, they've stored their, their life's monetary energy in the stock that they own. And up until recently, they hadn't sold shares and, you know, until about 2018. Um, so they had 20 years of their life force solely invested in that. And they own large swathes of that company. Now, if they were to uh, sell their entire stock on the market, it would crash the price by 80 or 90% because they can't do that. Now, why do they, you know, firstly, they don't have to, and secondly, it would crash the price precipitously because there would be all that stock on the market for purchase. And if there's a market, it, the price needs to fall to meet where the market is. But because they don't have to sell, it holds up the price. But if they were to put all their stock on the market tomorrow, then the price falls precipitously. And this is where, if you understand that Bitcoin's the greatest form of money ever invented, and money represents the greatest form of optionality that you can have for your life's work slash energy, because any good can be exchanged for it, then you look at, say, the example of Elon Musk and Bezos, that have 99% of their net wealth in their stock, maybe a little bit less, but give or take, 99%. And I look at that and I think, well, that's Amazon stock. That's Tesla. That only trades for 36 hours a week. That's not a pretty good deal for optionality of my time and being able to purchase things. It means I've got to turn up between 10 and 4 p.m. every week to sell that stock to get money out to then buy what I want. Whereas Bitcoin is open 24-7, 365. Plus all the regulatory constraints that, you know, there could be claims of insider trading and taxes and everything else. You know, there's a lot of constraints there, so. Correct. And I look at this and I think, you know, personally I look at this and I think I, I think you know we have an opportunity in front of us that Jeff Bezos had in you know 1999 or 1995 whenever he started that business that except rather than owning Amazon back in 95 that went up a thousand X we get to you know 
own Bitcoin, which is a far bigger concept, far bigger market than that. And there is less people on this system. I, I think it's less than 1%. I think it's 0.1% yeah. of the population really understands what, what the enormity of what we're sitting in front of is. And so I look at this and think, if you can hold the quality of stock like Amazon back in 1995 and know where it's going, that's the equivalent of Bitcoin today. There's more upside in front of us than behind us. And when you understand what that optionality is, people are going to hoard that and store all of their wealth in it. And this is where, you know, you and I in five or 10 years time may have 99.9% .9 of our wealth in Bitcoin because that gives us the greatest optionality. And people like options, I like options. And this is where, you know, from an investment perspective, you want to have the greatest optionality that you can have because it gives you the most opportunities. So, well, that, that's the whole point of money. You don't want money for the sake of money. You want money for the sake of what it can buy. It's, it's, a, it's a value statement. I want the money so I can acquire the things I want. Yes. And that's optionality. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And that's, you know, Bitcoin is better at doing that than property, than bonds, than political currencies, and then dead stocks even. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's a better money in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah. I think another example of um, market cap being downstream of price was oil. In, in the lockdowns yes. of, of 2020, because you know a lot of people may not know this, but oil went negative briefly, correct? It it went, did. Yeah, it went negative when when the pandemic was beginning, the world was shut down, oil trade negative, and that's because there were all these ships, you know, in, in ports and oceans just like this one, you know, they were just sitting there with all this oil and they were losing money. So there was this negative price in oil temporarily, and and I think a lot of people had trouble understanding that then, and likewise today have trouble understanding what we're saying about Bitcoin being this hyper exponential thing because it's like all the oil in the world the price is set at these margins in these harbors right and so in the same way that this slight oversupply or the slight lower demand at the margins for oil crash price negative i mean then the question to you is peter what happens if the opposite begins where we were at dinner last night we were joking like you know what if the saudis are just spending you know these years setting up these accounts and then suddenly they just buy them all like what happens peter if someone or a group of people or some company or country just buys them all in the course of a few months or a year or a few weeks or whatever it is like what what happens then do people freak out is price just is it a parabolic overnight action like what is that what will that look like for people in real practical terms as this occurs i think there will be shock because what i think will happen is you know i i go to bed some nights thinking is tonight the night i wake up and bitcoin's got a floor set at a million dollars because either the bond market or a country with a money printer has figured out this is what it should be. So um, my thinking on this is, is that when you have a money printer, you can pay whatever you want for that because it doesn't cost you anything. And so for any country with a money printer, I'm like, that's the game. That's the end game, getting an asset that you, you, know, you can't easily reproduce. In fact, you can't reproduce more of you're only allowed so many a, a time. I, I look at this and think it's, you know, in my head, sort of a cartoonish example of this would be like an elephant stepping on a tube of toothpaste. It's just going to rock it up vertically. And, and this is where the conversation we had around trading. I, I don't understand the trading around Bitcoin because for me, I look at this and I think that could happen any day and it will happen one day without notice. We'll get an egg, like just a a new floor will be set at a totally unbelievable margin. 10x, 100x. Whatever that may be. And I'll pick up the phone, I'll call you, I'll say, are you seeing what I'm seeing on the screen? I just need to make sure someone's not pranking me. It'll be the same on your screen and globally. Um, we'll all high five and think, wow, that's amazing. But the, the very real might just hold off as this. <laughs> Uh, That's fantastic. We, we, we've got a tractor funded by um, uh, the Fed and Jay Powell right now, trying to yeah, trying to drown out our <laughs> <laughs> trying to drown out our conversation. So. so anyway, we're talking about Bitcoin new floor set. There's a new floor yeah, set, and the, specs, yeah. all, all of a sudden, you know, you've now got governments en entering the picture who have zero cost to produce money to purchase Bitcoin. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense to me. You get to acquire a, the hardest asset known to man and it costs you nothing. It's yeah. the greatest trade ever. I wish the Australian government would do that. Yeah. I actually hope the US government would do that. Well, it's exactly what Michael Saylor's doing. I mean, obviously him on a much smaller degree, but basically it's sell as much of my stock as I can, raise as much debt as I can, raise as much money as I can, buy as much Bitcoin as I can, keep it for as long as I can, and just do that perpetually. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's like, 
the, the big the big deal with Sailor was not just, oh, we have a CEO, now we just have a billionaire that's doing this. It's like, it's validation of the game theory. Of you sell off the weaker assets, raise as much political money for the weaker asset, and then buy the stronger asset, hold it, to back then, you know, further of everything else. It's like this feedback loop that just compounds on top of itself. It's almost like the playbook for buying real estate. Yeah. Buy real estate, it goes up a little bit, leverage that, buy more, goes up a little bit, leverage that, you can buy more all of a sudden in a 30 year period, you've got a huge property portfolio. And this is where, you know, I look at the demand drivers for Bitcoin, like what could create something like this? Yeah. Um, you know, there are sort of two huge markets, I think, which could be a complete game changer from a demand perspective. Um, the first is the energy markets, oil. You know, there's roughly somewhere between seven to $10 billion worth of trade globally mm -hmm. in the oil markets. And I think they're the first people who should get this and want yeah. hard money uh, because it's you know, quite symbiotic with what their operations are. Yeah. Um, when they want Bitcoin for their, you know, for their hard earned oil yeah. um, rather than US dollars, you know, that's the equivalent of somewhere between two to three Michael Saylors entering yeah. the market every single day. All of a sudden, what does that do when there are two million coins on exchange? Michael Saylor's got 150,000 plus coins, and you now have two and a half of him entering the market every single day. Chasing an exponentially smaller amount of coins. Yeah. Correct. And this is where the numbers don't add up. You know, the conversations we have about to share these thoughts, these are the, and this is why I don't like talking about the number that it leads to. I'm far more. Um, curious around the intellectual debate around yep. is the thinking right and this is the fun part that you know being a study of you know finance and economics for the last two and a half decades this is the fun part where it's like no economics doesn't work in an accretive fashion when there's competition between you know functions of money it actually becomes exponential not an accretive so yep. um, this is where I think you know what you do and what I do is so important that you know we want to help people around us to preserve their wealth and you know hopefully you know insulate them from any economic mm, catastrophes that are coming and I, I personally view this as you know the greatest tool for doing that and oh, that's a very superficial reason for doing that I think it has a, a much it, it will have a much bigger impact on society moving forward and I think it has the ability to um, bring changes to society which are going to be hugely beneficial on a personal level but also on a societal level so on many fronts Bitcoin you know ticks some boxes and for me I spend my days you know on the very low level of consciousness in Bitcoin talking about price because that's as an investment advisor that's what people want to that's what people care discuss about. yeah yeah, uh, yeah I, I think you and I are both on the same page along with most Bitcoiners about how it's the mission and it's the larger view, the long-term view. That's really what keeps us going. That's what keeps us working, working, working for this. Because, I mean, the way I would put it is that if, like I said earlier, money is this tool at which we communicate value to each other, if we change that medium, if we change that tool which we communicate through, and it's no longer through political will or political influence or political coercion, and it's through just a math equation, just raw numbers and real data, I mean, that changes our perception of what's valuable. And I think we, that we're seeing that so much with people changing their value structure. You talk about Maslow's uh, hierarchy needs all the time. Um, you, you know, So there's just so many ways that people are reorienting themselves on this new paradigm of communicating value to each other. And that, to me, is what's exciting. But yeah, you're right about people care about price mostly, so. <laughs> and, and you know what, because that's our largest problem. Yeah. Literally, you know, money problems are, the world's biggest problem yeah. and Bitcoin works to solve that on two fronts firstly I think it's number go up technology so if you look at Maslow's needs hierarchy the base layer is basically um, physiological needs right? food and shelter yeah. you know which is a money constraint so you buy Bitcoin it basically levels you up on that so all of a sudden you don't need to concern yourself with that and then you can start thinking about bigger things like love and connection and then you know ascending that um, and this is what's really exciting for me is that it solves that problem but while it's solving that problem it's also changing you as a person internally to realize maybe all of those you know monetary aspirations that I had of fancy boats and private jets and blah 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 aren't really that important yeah <laughs> like they really aren't important like people think oh if I get x y or z I'm going to be happy and it's like I could give you that tomorrow and it will not solve 
the happiness problem. Yeah. And this is where um, Bitcoin is a forcing function to look inside and actually have a deeper look at what's important to you. And I know we get excited talking about, you know, hypothesizing about number go up, but the, the real change and benefit I think is a, a personal one. And my hope is that, you know, we can spread that message to um, help improve people's lives yeah. because I think it, it is a forcing function for that. You've got number go up tech and then you've got, well, you're almost required to look internally to improve yourself and think about that so yeah yeah i often say that this whole you know quote unquote clickbait of you know 10 million dollars of bitcoin 100 million dollars of bitcoin or in your case billions of dollars of bitcoin <laughs> is that it's it's funny because people think that it's deceptive or wrong because oh, i don't really believe i couldn't possibly bitcoin's going 100 million dollars and then once you go to the rabbit hole it's like yeah you're right i don't really believe that but it's because I think that's too bearish, right? Yes, that's, <laughs> I, I that's think the that's funny too thing. pessimistic, right? So it's like, yes, you're right. I don't believe this, but I'm tempering my expectations. <laughs> so. I, I had a conversation uh -huh. recently where someone said, "You think Bitcoin's going to be seven billion dollars a coin?" I went, "Yeah, that's a conservative figure, straight face." And I, I literally believe that when I say that because if people really understood what yeah. this thing is and the future potential, um, I, I think it should be. That would be fair market value. In fact, yeah. it'd be ultra conservative. And this is where you know one of the one of my beliefs, which helps sort of cement that foundation of how critical Bitcoin will be in the future, is thinking about um, although it's a nascent technology, and this is something my brother talks about, is that we have the technology to send a rocket into space to then shoot a missile at it with a nuclear warhead on it at an asteroid traveling through space at hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour and explode that so it doesn't come and destroy Earth. But we do not have the technology to stop Bitcoin. But Jerome Powell has the technology to have a tractor <laughs> <laughs> keep coming into he's, our sound here. So <laughs> He sent his minions to stop the message. Yes, yeah. yes. Drown them out with noise. We can't, we, you know, and I mean, <laughs> actually, ironically, I think that's what they're doing with Bitcoin. They can't stop Bitcoin. And the only thing you can do with Bitcoin is drown it out with noise and chaos and confusion. I mean, anyway, so ironically, I think that's true. But um, but anyway, so $7 billion, um, someone watching this that hasn't heard you break that down, maybe they've been listening and they're like, okay, I get the larger point, but come on, Peter, how can I take you seriously? Seven, yeah. not million, billion. billion. Okay, seven billion is a hundred times more than 70 million, right? Yeah. And then 70 million is like, whatever, whatever a thousand times more. Than so like, can you break down how we get to those absurd numbers and how that's conservative? Sure. In light of everything we said already? Yeah. So if you, um, the $7 billion number is really, it, it's not um, intellectually correct, if you think about it. Yeah. And But that's the conservative number. So I'll just go through. The $7 billion is quite simply, you've got $6.3 trillion worth of global trade and you've got 900 Bitcoin minted on the day. So you divide 6.3 trillion by 900 Bitcoin and you get to $7 billion a coin. Now people say, oh, that's absurd. That would never happen and the rest of it. It's like, look, I totally get it. But how much, how much stock did Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos sell for the first 25 years of their life? In Jeff Bezos's case, he sold precisely zero because he had the best asset ever and then he could get whatever he wanted by using that and leveraging that to then go and purchase what he needed. So he didn't need to sell. Yeah. Now with Bitcoin and what's coming, you don't need to sell. Yeah, with, with the difference with Amazon is that it reaches market maturity, right? Correct. Bitcoin doesn't. Correct. Because it's a perpetual long, right? So anyway. <laughs> so for that reason, um, I understand that, we got the truck back. Um, I understand that you know, that's a very simplistic look at it because if you look at that 6.3 trillion global uh, trade per day, you know, basically a lot of it's rehypothecated for transactions. So I, I get it. There's a million ways to break down and say that that's not a genuine example. And I agree with that. But if you look at the other example, the triple point asset, so sort of going into that a little bit deeper, you know, the triple point in thermodynamics is when um, matter is in all three states at the one time. And it's a very curious thing that, you know, we didn't see this throughout history up until maybe the 1850s. Um, and I forget who discovered it, but what happened was um, someone did an experiment. They put water in a beaker. They had it in a vacuum where they could lower the pressure, lower the temperature, and then there is a certain point at a certain pressure and a certain temperature where 
what was water in this beaker turns into steam, ice and gas. Very curious, how does one element exist in three states at the one time? It's such a bizarre thought. And throughout the entire history, we weren't aware of it until the 1850s. And lo and behold, wow, this is possible. This is really unique. And that, you know, that flashpoint of an inception of an idea and a complete paradigm shift in what we thought was possible is what I think Bitcoin is to money in that it's the first triple point asset. It's the first asset that exists in those three states at the one time. And then when you have those, that one asset in three states at the one time, you have competitive tension to be purchased and used. And so all of a sudden, that competition creates an exponential. And so if you think seven billion is outrageous, you know, the, the thinking I've got on the triple point is that it should be store of value multiplied by medium exchange multiplied by unit of account. And in which case, money is irrelevant anyway, and we're back to what Jeff Booth says, that yeah. you, know, you can't value the new system from within the existing. Yeah. It's a complete paradigm shift. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think, to clarify, so 7 billion current having, the next year, eight, uh, you know. 14. Yeah, 14 billion. Five years from now, 28 billion. And then, you know, so then we're getting hundreds of billions in the 2030s. And that model is just this oversimplistic way of trying to communicate this to our fiat brains. And what you're saying is really many orders of magnitude greater than that in, in purchasing power, just because it won't even be relevant anymore. Correct. Yeah. And people don't understand how few people own Bitcoin now. Yeah. You know, these Bitcoin whales, you know, they probably 15 million of the 20 million supply was bought for less than a thousand dollars. Yeah. Do they need to sell? Yeah. No, they would have sold by now. You know, they, okay, sure, they might want to do X, Y, or Z, and this is where, you know, it's really important to understand that, you know, price is determined at the margin, and market cap is downstream of price. You know, people can't comprehend the market cap, but the market cap's really irrelevant. And I, th and I think something, too, is that people look at that and they say, oh, there's not many coins left, but they fail to understand that it will just continue to be that whales with exponential. Like, right now, people with 100,000 or 10,000 coins are major whales. In a couple of years, people with a hundred or a thousand coins like they'll be the whales and then people with one coin will be the whales and then people with a tenth of a coin or a hundredth of a coin or a thousandth of a coin we just go out and out and out cycle after cycle you know decade after decade and I don't think even most Bitcoiners that own Bitcoin today realize the true magnitude of what they own like if they own a tenth of a Bitcoin that's a whale amount amount of sats you know that's 10 million sats which you know, in 50 years or 100 years, which many people holding it, that's their lifetime, or that's their kid's lifetime. It's like that's an absurd amount of value. I mean, you know, the simple way to think about it is just divide it by global prosperity. And perhaps even your thought experiment of multiplying the three together should have the fourth component multiplied of future prosperity. You know, future prosperity is 10x, right? Yep. Then maybe it should be multiplied 10x depending where we're going out in the future. So anyway, it's crazy to think about, so. It, it presents a a huge challenge to the traditional system and how we think about things and one of the points that you raised which I thought you know um, I credit you with having um, such a fabulous um, reason for being for Bitcoin that I think everyone needs to hear on the technology front and one thing I think about is you know you talk about life getting better exponentially better and I agree with that wholeheartedly and one thing that sort of runs through my head is if life is getting exponentially better um, then the long-term interest rates I feel should be a lot lower than the short term and this is where one of my favorite points is the time locking function of Bitcoin if you can send your monetary power from now to the future you don't need to send a lot and all of a sudden it becomes a massive fortune in the future yeah. so um, all of these things are up for debate when it comes to Bitcoin because it's a complete paradigm shift. Yeah, yeah, completely. So, um, all right. So as we wrap up here, I think I think something that you and I both care about. You know, it looks like the beach is getting busier here. <laughs> but um, you know, we've talked a lot about Bitcoin number go up, Bitcoin's this paradigm shift, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And probably a lot of people watching us have heard that for 100 hours plus. But I think what still is under discussed and appreciate is that yes, you have to prepare for that. But number one, buying Bitcoin, but the whole self-custody thing. I talk to people all the time. You know, I, I joined your company, The Bitcoin Advisor, mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, and 
it's amazing to me just so many people care so much about Bitcoin and they're learning so much and they're still trying to figure out self custody they're still trying to figure out everything of that sort so I'd love it if you could touch on the urgency the significance and the importance of uh, self custody and then what specifically the Bitcoin advisor does in regards to that and helping people in that process sure thing so I, I think there is huge urgency for anyone who has bitcoins on exchange to get them off exchange as quickly as possible there are a number of reasons why that's really important firstly we've had a number of exchanges fall over in the last year or two so I don't want anyone to lose their coins um, secondly um, from a selfish perspective it helps the number go up but if there aren't any coins on exchange then that decreases supply and it's a forcing function for price to go up so that's really critical um, it is very daunting um, and you know it takes I believe hundreds if not a few hundred hours to get comfortable with self custody so it is a very difficult thing to do and this is where you know the work I've done with families for the last seven years has been all around collaborative custody to help clients take bitcoins off exchange and self custody it so um, it doesn't become a daunting process and clients can leverage off our time and expertise in this space and they don't have to do the work they can just pay for it yeah. and um, I would never want price to be a deterrent for people getting coins off exchange so the Bitcoin advisor has a whole host of free resources as to what a good setup for collaborative custody looks like so the reason for being for the Bitcoin advisor is to help anyone get bitcoins off exchange we want to do that in the safest way possible providing self-sovereignty with multiple backups so that if the client mucks something up they're not going to lose their bitcoin and we we can recover that either for themselves or alternatively if something were to happen to them um, you know their estate their wife their children can give us a call and in a collaborative effort we can recover that so it's a it's a really critical function once um, you start thinking beyond yourself and you know the reason why we do this is to set up intergenerational wealth for our you know future kids and generations to come and one of the things that you know we've done is create a protocol that ensures that if that's the way you're thinking and that's what you want to do um, if you were hit by a bus tomorrow we can still recover that Bitcoin and this is where from you know just from the feedback we've gotten and the you know the inquiries I don't think a lot of people have put a lot of thought into that but because of you know my history and you know what I've done for the last seven years this is a problem that is top of mind that I've spent the last seven years staring at and tried to solve yeah. so I think we've got a great solution um, for that reason if people have any questions reach out and if price is the issue there are free resources yeah. on that we don't want that to be a sticking yeah. point for getting your coins off exchange so Definitely. on a more personal note too you, you, you said if someone's hit by a bus on a personal note we're filming this on um, whatever it is Wednesday and on Sunday I was in a car accident so <laughs> <laughs> my first car accident I was going you know, like 45 50 or whatever I, you know thank God everyone was fine but you know obviously later on in, in the uh, yesterday actually I was like oh wow yeah that would have been bad you know I, I've only been in the Bitcoin advisor a few months and now you know I have a lot of my Bitcoin in a multi-sig bolt you know in collaborate with with us and it's like man if I if that would been it for me obviously I would have larger problems but <laughs> but still it would have been it would have been like okay all that life force I was working and saving for is now just gone you know which is a donation to the network but I thank you yes <laughs> you thank me but you know a lot of people don't want the donation to go to the network they want it to be for their kids so yeah. so anyway I, I fully agree with you and that's why I'm so excited to be working with you to hang out and you know, we, we talk all the time online to off camera and <laughs> so I've got to say it's a lot of fun it's, and yeah it's a blast I, I, I really you know part of the fun in the job it doesn't feel like a job for me because yeah. I love talking about Bitcoin and this is where you know getting to help clients and hearing their story um, being a Bitcoin is very isolating and so to anyone out there listening to this um, the social component of Bitcoin is really critical in helping that and the collaborative custody might help introduce family members or other loved ones to Bitcoin and you know cast yeah. a different light on what this is well that's one of the great things that people can join us we can help educate on how to set up multi sig vault how to do self custody you know all, all the trade-offs of managing that they get the peace of mind that if Bitcoin skyrockets to a million or, or five million or seven billion overnight that they're protected and they don't have that reapplication risk so they have that peace of mind 
they have the hit by a bus peace of mind and then they have that for their children that peace of mind and then in addition you know I have the experience now and, and you have even you know years more experience than me but then it's like it's an easy way for them to bring in family members because then they see, they see it themselves they watch us do it that they're, they're handheld through the process the, the, on, online and I mean to me that's that's one of the most exciting things like seeing them have even a whole nother level of peace of mind and then also you know better for their stack but then also bringing in the family or their friends or their co-workers whatever too it's an easy way for them to do that so yeah it's a nice 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 thing to do and yeah. you know I feel great doing it because you know I get to meet a lot of great people and hear their stories and help them out it's it's a win-win-win yeah great so well yeah of course you know people can find me my link will be in the description if they want to well free the first call is free right so you yeah. can talk to either Peter or myself free consultation link in the description if you want to take a multi-sig self-custody in that route but um, yeah besides that plug for <laughs> for our services do you have any final words Peter for or encouragement for folks as they think about Bitcoin's future or? I think I'd probably like to echo what you normally say, get off zero. Yeah. If you haven't taken action yet, please buy some, a little bit. Yeah. Whatever you're prepared to lose, whether it's $5 or 5000 um, do that, take action and start learning about it. And probably more important than buying some is actually start learning about it. And this is where um, your resources are fantastic. Um, you know, I've had you come and talk to our clients and one of the best communicators in the space. So, and you provide all your content for free. It's, it's fabulous. So learn as much as you can, and um, if that gives you the confidence to buy, then get stuck into it. Yeah, appreciate it. Peter, thank you. Thank this you. It was a good time, and now I guess we're going to go on and enjoy the rest of the day's activities. So Sounds thanks. great. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you so much for watching my content and being a supporter of mine. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun for me to do, and it's really meaningful to know that so many people are enjoying my content and learning about Bitcoin. I think it's so important for people to get off zero. In addition to getting off zero, it is really critical, it is really important that you also begin taking self-custody of your sats and of your Bitcoin. This is because if you have Bitcoin on an exchange or you don't have proper self-custody, this is going to be a massive problem for you in the future, most likely. If Bitcoin starts having rapid periods of appreciation and there are rapid spikes in demand for Bitcoin, for Bitcoin education and for Bitcoin advocates and advisors, it's going to be increasingly important that you have self-custody of those coins. So my message to you is please consider getting that self-custody. Now, you can do that on your own. There are plenty of free tutorials online. There's plenty of great work like that. But if you want somebody to help you with self-custody, if you want somebody to help you take cold storage of your Bitcoin, of your Satoshis, if you want somebody to help you set up a multi-sig vault, to set up an estate plan, to set up a plan for you as a person, an individual, um, as a business owner, as a charity, whatever the case, I work at the Bitcoin Advisor and I'm happy to say uh, that I, I really enjoy it. I love working with my clients. You know, my job is literally to help people uh, buy Bitcoin and secure it properly for years, decades, and generations to come. So if you want to learn about my services at the Bitcoin Advisor and what we do, you should click the link in the description. Uh, here you can see, read a bit about what I do. You can book a, a free consultation with me. You can book a free meeting with me. I'll send you lots of free complimentary paperwork explaining how multi-sig vaults work, cold storage, giving you all the education you need. Everything's fully open source what we do. Our main goal is education, helping get coins off exchanges, and people be able to not lose sleep at night when they buy and secure their Bitcoin. So you can feel free to book a meeting with me. The first one is free and complimentary just to figure out what your priorities are and get that adjusted. But if that's something that could be used to you, I, I really really highly encourage you to take self-custody, whether that's with me or not, please just do it. <laughs> but for the many of you that probably will eventually want a multi-sig collaborative custody vault, the Bitcoin advisor could be the place to go. And so click the link in the description, check that out. Really appreciate your time. And let's get back to that Bitcoin education. Thanks. Do a sample shot here. Yeah. Get audio levels on, on my setup. Yeah. Um, because chances are you're going to... <laughs> You're gonna want to take the audio from my setup. <laughs> it was like your little sound. I can tell exactly what you're thinking. <laughs>